Your Excellencies, members of the FEMIS Council, members of FEMIS, ladies and gentlemen, good friends. Hello to welcome you on behalf of the International Institute for Middle East and Balkan Studies, EFIMES from Ljubljana, the organizer of today's <coughs> lecture of Professor Dr. Zaki Shalom, with the title Formulating Israel's Strategy in Changing the World Order. A special welcome and gratitude goes to our guest from uh, today from Israel, the accommodated and highly respected Professor Dr. Zaki Shalom. I wish Professor Shalom pleasant state in the, our wonderful country. I would also like to thank the Embassy of the State uh, of Israel based in Jerusalem and Ambassador Mr. Shmuel Meram for a good cooperation we have for many years now. Professor, Professor, Professor Dr. Zaki Shalom is a member of the research staff of, at the Institute for National Security Studies and the, and, uh, and the Ben Gurion Research Institute at Ben uh, Gurion. University. He has published extensively, extensively of, on various facts of Israel defense policy, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the role of the superpowers in the Middle East, and Israel's struggle against terror. His work has also focused of, on the study of Israel's nuclear option, both in historical and temporary perspectives. In his lecture, our guest will present his view on Israel's role in contemporary international relations, the situations in the Middle East, and on the Israel-Arab conflict. And now I give the floor to Professor Dr. Zaki Shalom. Okay. Welcome. Thank you, sir. It's indeed a great honor for me to be in this group and to visit your wonderful country this first time. I almost uh, begin to fall in love with your country. It's a small country. It resembles somehow many facets of Israel. And uh, uh, I met with people, I met with students, and as of now, thanks God, everything went uh, very nicely. And I do hope that we uh, in Israel and you here, in the, especially in the academic track, will enhance our relationship because I think we have a lot to learn from one, one, one another and there is a lot of, lot of fields that we can uh, cooperate together and for the benefit of uh, both our people and our states. Uh, I will speak about Israel's security uh, environment, security thinking, I'll give you some brief history. I would say that if there is one event in the world that determined Israel security thinking, even before the Holocaust, this is the Munich Agreement between the big powers and, uh, and uh, uh, Germany with regard to Czechoslovakia. You know, I, I was uh, researching for many years Ben Gurion and, and his archives, his diaries are filled with this topic. How is it possible that the big powers actually abandoned Czechoslovakia, who was a democracy, who was a peaceful state? And nobody, nobody, uh, nobody in Czechoslovakia spoke about any territorial expansion, anything like that. And then suddenly, Germany, Nazi Germany, come and say the Sudeten is ours. You either give it to us by peaceful means, or we take it by force. And then the big powers, as you know, I don't have to tell you this historic event, actually imposed on Czechoslovakia this deal and told them if you want for the peace sake you have to, to, to leave the Sudeten land and to give it to, to, uh, to, to Germany. This of course did not uh, prevent the war altogether. It, uh, it just maybe postponed it, but you know the, the appetite of the Nazis was too big uh, in the Sudeten land was just a small part which they wanted to, to incorporate in their own state. The lesson for, for Israel and for our first prime minister was 
that states like Israel cannot trust anybody in the world to come to our help when we are in need. That means even, even alliance with great powers cannot replace our ability to defend ourselves by ourselves against any threat or any combination of, of threat. This is the legacy that Ben Gurion has left from the beginning of a statehood until he, he passed away. He said, Israel, if Israel is going to have an alliance with any other state, it's, going, it's not going to replace our force. It's going to be in addition. If the United States want us to, have, to be part of NATO or to have alliance with the United States, that's fine. But this is not going to replace our own force. Because once we're attacked, we cannot trust anybody to come to our help. The world, even, even, even if there is a written document, even if there is written alliance, when it comes to test every state, judge whether it's going to help or not, according to its national interest. And not, national interest does, does mean that they, they will come to our help when we need it. And we actually witnessed it in, during the, during the Six-Day War, when Israel, when uh, President uh, Nasser of Egypt uh, closed, the, closed the, the Straits of Tehran, and we had kind of a group with the United States that in, in such a case, the United States will help us to, uh, to open it. And we came to, to, to President Johnson and uh, to the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, and we said, look, we have, uh, we have written an agreement. We said, okay, but you know, circumstances have changed. Circumstances have changed. And maybe we'll try to, 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 to find a way of compromise, maybe we'll solve it another way. Eventually, you know, Israel didn't listen to any one of them and opened a, a, a preventive strike against Egypt. And, you know, the, 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 out, the result of this uh, warfare is known to everybody here. But again, what I'm saying is that this is, this is the legacy because if we are going now to speak about Iran and the threat that Iran poses to Israel, we first have to know that the, this legacy of the, the, the period between the Second World, uh, the First and the Second World War, is the is the period that actually formulated the thinking of the of the Israeli of Israel leaders when the state was was established. And the other uh, the other thing is of obviously known is the the Holocaust. We are survivors of the Holocaust. And this is something that has been uh, crucial and uh, a dramatic effect on the thinking of the Jewish people in Israel and the Israel government. Israel has gone to, to, to establish what we call its nuclear option. Uh, we call it nuclear option, not nuclear ab ability, because Ben Gurion said, I don't care what we really have. What I really want is that the other side would think that we have a nuclear capability. What is important is not what we have in Dimona. What is it, what important is what the Arabs think that we have in Dimona. Okay? And this is the thing that will, will really cause the deterrence. That means that if the Arabs will ever think of destruction of Israel, annihilating the Jewish people as they used to do in the, as the Nazis did in the Holocaust, they have to know that we have the power to annihilate all the art world. This is the, this is the, the, the whole idea of the build up of what we call the nu nuclear option, which is now a, a strategic factor that uh, has, has, has changed altogether the thinking, the status of Israel and the, its image around the world. Uh, and this is the, actually the, 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 the factor that actually also uh, determines our relationship to the Iranian threat. And if you follow the, the, the uh, uh, speeches, many, many speeches of Netanyahu with regard to the Iranian issue, he always said, look, in 1938, everybody said Hitler is not serious. Hitler, Hitler is, is, ju is just uh, making a trick. He's speaking about the Jews the destruction of the Jewish people just in order to, to, to gain some uh, popularity inside Germany. So don't take it too seriously. He's not going to do it. Nobody's going to think about annihilation of the Jewish people. Well, eventually it happened. Six million of our people were, were 
uh, to take into to concentration camps, uh, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, and others, and and they they are gone. And they are gone. They are gone. The six million people were were killed during the Holocaust. So we we cannot we cannot underestimate anybody's threat, anybody's threat, and especially now with regard to, to the Iranian threat. We believe that Iran Iran views the build up of nuclear capability as essential, essential and crucial national interest of Iran for very simple reasons. If you sit in Iran, you sit in Tehran, and you look around, you see states like India with nuclear capability, Pakistan with nuclear capability, Russia with nuclear capability. Turkey doesn't have the capability, nuclear capability, but it is part of NATO, which is, which is the umbrella of nuclear uh, capability. And Israel has nuclear capability, according to the, to the Iranians. So, so the Iranians said, how is it possible that we, a state that thinks of itself, or at least aspire to be a leading state in the region, doesn't have this capability? We cannot afford it. We need it. And we believe that this, is, this issue is not under uh, any kind of controversy inside Iran. There is opposition in Iran to the government, but the, this opposition doesn't relate to the nuclear capability. With regard to the issue of nuclear capability, there is a, a very broad consensus inside <coughs> Iran. That means, in our view, even a change in the regime in Iran, and some people has, come, has, has been telling us, why, why do you go against the nuclear capability? Try to go against the regime. And we say, we believe that any other regime that would come would not change it. Maybe it would, it would be more forthcoming to, toward the Western world. Maybe it would be more moderate. Maybe it would less uh, tr try to, uh, to go on insurgency inside Arab states. Maybe it would do that. But as far as the nuclear issue inside Iran, we believe there is a very broad consensus inside Iran. And that's why we think that a change of regime in Iran would not solve our problem. And now people say, look, you are paranoid. You are so fearful. What do you fear from? What do you fear from? Iran, even if Iran would go and become a nuclear state, it would never dare attack Israel with nuclear capability for one, for few, few simple reasons. In the first place, Iran knows, or at least is estimate, that Israel has a nuclear capability and can wipe out Tehran and other in the whole state of Iran in, in half an hour. That's what they think. I don't want to say if it's true or not, but that this is their assessment. So who is crazy? What kind of leader would undertake such such a a, a, a risk? to attack Israel and to suffer a major retaliation against his, his, own, his own state. And he knows the consequences. Because unfortunately, we already know what are the consequences of a nuclear, nuclear strike. So the Iranians, people say, look, they are rational people. They are rational people. They are not crazy people. They know what they are doing. They're not going to, to, to undertake such a risk to their own state. This is one thing. The other thing is, that's what people tell us. Look, Israel ha is known to have the best anti-ballistic missile system in the world, the aero system. It's the best system in the world. This is not, not, not the Iron Dome, which is, which is protecting against short range missile. We have the best system which has already been uh, been experienced with American scientists and American military officers and has been proved almost 90% of success in, 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 in neutralizing rockets that were, were launched in the Mediterranean Sea and it's, it uh, has a very, very big percentage of success. So the, we say, we, we were told, 
the Iranians also know this issue, this this, this uh, factor. Are they crazy? They are going to launch a missile from Iran, knowing that it might fall somewhere, either in Iraq or in Jordan. In, in any way, its chances to hit Israel are very slim. So what? Are, they are not crazy. They are not going to do it. And the third thing that the, the, that we are have discussing with the United States in this regard, the Americans say, look. Everybody knows that America is committed to the security of Israel. And the American president has made it very, very clear that in case Israel is threatened or attacked by another power with unconventional weapons, the United States would, would retaliate against this power. So this is a commitment that has been done by the American president, American secretary of state, American secretary of defense, you cannot, no, no, nobody can neglect, nobody can ignore such commitment made by the top leaders of the United States. They <laughs> said that to us, look, you have, you have got a really great, great umbrella of security. Why are you making this issue such, such a, so obsessively? Every time, everywhere you go, you speak about Iran, 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 Iran. You are so protected. You are so powerful. Why, why do you make it such a problem? And our leaders say, and I, I agree with them. I agree with them. Maybe there is just 1% of chance that we will be attacked. Maybe there is, a, there is just half percent. But there is a chance. There is a chance that somebody in Iran would say, I will take this chance. I want to be remembered in history as the one who attacked Israel with the nuclear rockets. And then what? Then what? 200,000 Israelis would be killed. We know that he can launch just one. Just one time he can, he can, he can do it, no more. Because after that he will not be able to, to launch any, anything. Okay, but this one, if it causes 100,000, 200,000 people killed in Israel, this is no longer Israel. This is no longer Israel. I don't know how we will come out of it. So we say, we don't take this chance. We, we don't take this chance. This is a crucial issue for us. And the policy of the Israeli government is that it will not let Iran become a nuclear state. If it can be done by political means, it's fine. We don't want any, we don't want war, we don't want any military strike. But if there is, it's not go going to be done by, by diplomatic means, we are ready to do it. We would prefer to do it with the United States. If not possible, we'll do it by ourselves. We know that we cannot, or the possibility that we will be able to destroy all the nuclear installation of, of Iran are not very big because they are <clears throat> spread all over the country and many of them are dig under the ground and it's not an easy thing for Israel to do. But we believe, we believe that, that if we will be capable of causing mass destruction, massive destruction to the Iranian nuclear, nuclear, nuclear capability, they will not renew it again. Because they are smart people. The Iranian people, the Iranian leaders would ask themselves, look, we have invested in this project billions of dollars, billions of billions of dollars. We have suffered economic sanctions. We suffer from international isolation. And then the Israelis come and destroy, not all of it, 80%. 60%. If they will, will go on with it, they, will, they might, might, hit, might hit us again. So we think there is a possibility that the Iran said we're going to halt. We're not going to renew it. By the way, this, this is what happened to, 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 uh, in the case when Israel hit the, the Osirak uh, uh, nuclear capability in Iraq in 81. And that actually what happened until now after, according to, 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 to foreign uh, press, Israel hit the, 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 the nuclear, uh, nuclear facility in, uh, near, in Syria. They didn't renew it. They didn't renew it. 
So we think that there is a big, uh, a good chance that even if we are not capable of feeding and destroying all those, all the, all the, uh, the, the facilities of Iran, we might hit them in such a way that they will rethink about the whole nuclear project. And as I said, our, our policy was from the very beginning that we prefer this to be undertaken by uh, the United States. And in fact, as you know, the President of the United States came with a very, very uh, clear declaration. He said, our policy with regard to Iran is prevention, not containment. We will not let Iran become a nuclear power. That's what he said in his own words, many times, privately and openly. <clears throat> And said, we, 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 we will prefer the, the diplomatic course, but if this is, not, this is not going to work out, every option is on the table. That's what he said many, many times. And when he was asked, when he was asked, what is the American policy toward nuclear project in Iran? He said, the Iranians can develop only nuclear project for peaceful energy. If they want for peaceful energy, that's fine. We, we will be even ready to help them in, in, in doing that. But we will not let, let them enrich uranium that will, will bring them to, to what uh, your, your, your Excellency said, to the, to the position where they will be on the, on, on the, uh, on the course towards becoming a nuclear power within six months or eight months or nine months. That's, that's what he said openly in his own words. And what we see now, unfortunately, is totally different course. What the, America, what, what the United States has done actually now with this agreement, this agreement with Iran is giving them the ability to enrich uranium to a certain percentage. There is inspection. Yes, there is inspection. But everything depends eventually on the goodwill of the Iranians. If they want to be nice, they will let the, the inspector come in. If they don't want, they are, they are smart enough to drag dime to tell them, we cannot let you now, maybe you come again, we're not ready. You know, it, 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 they know how to do it. They know how to do it. And then what you do? We, will, we believe that the Iranians will not, will not breach this agreement openly and dramatically. They will do it slowly, slowly. And every time that you will see that they are not standing by their commitment, you will, you will ask yourself, is it worthwhile for this to go to war? No. It's just a small thing. And then you, you will have to, 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 to apply to them to, to make their, their, their case. Why, why, why have they breached the agreement? And then if they, it's, it's done, you have to bring it to the United Nations. The Security Council, it may take months and months and months until maybe, maybe somebody will say, yes, the bridge is going so what? So again, we believe <coughs> that what has been done in recent months with the Iranians is a very, very risky and dangerous course. If we believe that the Iranians are going to be uh, Scandinavians, very peaceful people, not looking for nuclear capability, not putting their their their, their armies and their security uh, security um, uh, authorities, Yemen, in, in Syria, in Iraq, everywhere, in Lebanon, in the Hamas, in Gaza. Well, that's fine, but we believe this is not realistic. We believe that what, what happens now with, the, with, the, with this agreement, unfortunately, is actually encouraging the Iranians 
to go on with their nuclear development. They see that if one, you, when, when you are stubborn, when you determined, the other side will actually yield and let you do what, what you want. And the reason for that has been said actually quite openly by, by President Obama in his very famous, uh, what, what he, they called after that, the Obama di uh, Doctrine. This was stated in his, uh, in his speech in West Point Academy in May 28, 2014. What he said in that is a very, very, is, is a marvelous, extremely, extremely interesting uh, presentation. What he said is almost all the Americans' military involvement after the Second World War outside the United States were wrong courses. They did not enhance, they did not, they, they, they did not do anything good for the American interest. They were done without deep thinking, without thorough thinking, and, and they, they were, he called them adventures. Military adventures which did not contribute to the American security, American interest in any way. In fact, it cost the United States billions, billions of dollars, thousands, hundreds of thousands of American troops being killed, and then say, what is, what is the outcome? What did we gain out of this? And now we said, my doctrine is different. I'm, I'm in favor of military capability. I'm going to enhance the, the, the military capability of the United States. But my position, that's what President Obama said, my position is that the United States troops would only be used only if the United States security, homeland security, will be in a clear and present danger. It's going to be in a real danger. I'm not going to solve the, the I'm not policeman of the world. I'm not going to solve other, other, other states' problems. This is, is up to them to them. Yes, I will help them. I will send them arms, weapons, as much as they want. But eventually, it's not my responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the United States to go to help other people with boots on the ground with, with American troops fighting for them. This, uh, these days are gone. These days are gone. And if this is a situation, and he of course, he of course justified it due to the trauma that the United States had in Afghanistan and Iraq. He said, we have looked, we have fought years in Afghanistan and Iraq. What did, what did, did we get? Iraq is, is totally destroyed. There is no, actually, Iraq. It's a, it's, a, it's a disintegrated state. And look what's happened in Afghanistan. What did we, did we get out of this? So, from Israeli point of view, the conclusion is very clear. The conclusion is very clear. And this goes back to what I said about David, David Ben-Gurion. Because what he really predicted is in becoming a real, a real, a real, a real factor. That means that if we are going to be in danger, nobody is going to help us to get out of this danger. And by, by the way, I think this is the lesson not only for Israel, but for many states in, in, in this region. Eventually, you have to know that if you are in danger, if you're a small state, and you are threatened by outside or inside forces, eventually you have to know that you have to take care of your own problem. You have to know that not alliance, not commitment, nothing will eventually help you. You will have to do it by yourself. If somebody comes to help you, that's fine, but I don't think you can rely on it. At least we in Israel believe that eventually we have to take care of our own problem. And now the situation is like this. There is already an agreement. The Congress has actually confirmed it. There's nothing you can do now. Certainly you cannot do it. We are following, and we have very good intelligence on what's going on inside Iran. We know what's going on inside Iran. We know it. 
and we will wait if these things go smoothly as predicted by the the the, 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 the American president well fine nobody wants to to send a Israeli troops or Israeli jets to hit uh, Iran nobody wants it but we have to ready for different scenarios and I believe that we are ready for that I believe that we are ready for that the other thing that, that is is uh, is coming in between Israel and United States, as you know, is what we call the peace process or the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and this also has two tracks. One track is the political; the other track is the terror. We have been following now two intifadas. One of them was, the second one was the most horrible because we had to cope with uh, suicide uh, terrorists, people who came with belts of explosive around their, their, their body and they would come into buses and to cafes and restaurants and everywhere. You couldn't, you couldn't, it was very hard to cope with it. I spoke an hour, uh, I will go to the students about this, uh, this topic. This was the dark, probably one of the darkest periods in Israel history uh, for two, three years. And one, not only because people, so many people were killed. In one month, February 2002, 132 Israelis were killed in, in, in those explosions inside Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem. And the, the greatest problem was not just the fact that Israelis were killed, but because many people thought there is no way to cope with this terror. And I, I told the students that one of the things that people used to say, how can you cope, how can you threaten, how can you deter somebody who wants to die? If, if you, if you, if somebody is, if somebody is paying out a crime here in Slovenia, in Israel, in the United States, you can tell them, look, you're going to be punished by death, death penalty. You're going to go, you're going to, to, to have, to, to, lo to, to lose your life. But if somebody says, I want to lose my life, I'm coming to, to, to lose my life because this is, this is something sacred for me. So how can you deter him? How can democracy deal with terror? When you have the ju ju judicial department who ask you everything, is it, is it legal or not legal? Can you arrest him? You cannot arrest him. Can you deport him from home? Can, can, can you destroy his house? Everything is under the ju judicial view and you cannot, you cannot run away from it in Israel. And then there is the international bodies who for everything inspect you and you know, people are killed thousand in Africa and Asia, but if there is one Israeli or one Palestinian king in Jerusalem, it's the head of the New York Times. We are always in the in the headlines of the news, always. I remember that Pre President Kennedy once asked Golda Meir, what would be your happiest day in your life? She said, the happiest day will be when I will look at the New York Times and I will see that Israel is the in the back page, not in the front page. I don't want us to be in, in, the, in the front page. But this is, not, this is not really realistic because we are, the world is looking at us differently than it looks on other, our, our, our countries, our nation. They expect us to be different. They expect us to be more moral. They expect us to be different. This is the situation. And by the way, I think this is, this is an honor for us. This is an honor for, not, for us. But it put on us certain uh, certain constraint to deal with this uh, with this issue issue of terror. But eventually, eventually, if we look at the history, the suicide terror which began 2000 in 2000 when Ari Sharon went up to to to, uh, to, to the holy place in uh, near Al Aqsa in 2000 September 2000. It ended in 2005, 2006. Since 2005, 
until now, until now, there has al almost been not one single act of suicide inside Israel. Not one single. So those who say democracies cannot deal with, with terror, they can come to us and learn that, yes, you can deal with it. You can deal with it. With the constraints, with the problem, with the criticism. Eventually, we did it without taking too harsh, too harsh uh, acts against the a Palestinian population. I know they suffer from what we're doing, but it's not, it's not our aim to make them suffer. We put blocks and we put soldiers and we put, we, we, we put constraint on their, their transportation, not because we want it, but because this is needed by our security. <coughs> and we hope one day we will not need it. And the other cause, as I said, is the political cause. We are engaged since the Oslo Agreement, September 1993, in a kind of ups and downs in the political track, the peace process with the Palestinians. We know exactly, or more or less exactly, how a settlement will look like. We know it. Israel will probably have to withdraw from large part of the West Bank, it, the line will go somewhere along the, the barrier that has been constructed. Plus minus, I cannot uh, say exactly. Uh, Jerusalem will have to find a certain kind of, of, uh, of compromise in which the Palestinians will have their, their share, we will have our share. And basically, basically, this has been also agreed by the United States. If you look at, at the letter that President Bush wrote to Prime Minister Ark Sharon on April 14, 2004. He said, we have, we have to recognize that new demographic realities has been uh, formulated in the West Bank and in every peace agreement, this must be recognized. That means that, that areas in the West Bank that are densely populated with Israeli settlers will remain eventually in the hands of Israel. Maybe Israel will have to give it for it in exchange some territory inside Israel. I don't know. But eventually the agreement is more or less clear. Now what stands is obviously some issues on how we are going to get to this agreement. And as you know, the big and big suspicion, distrust that we have in each other. We don't believe that they are going to fulfill the agreement. They don't believe that we are going to fulfill it. And if you hear Netanyahu, he says, look, we have withdrawn our different territories. We withdrew from Lebanon in 2000, May 2000, to the international border. And what did we get? We got the Hezbollah. Becoming, beca be becoming the authority in southern Lebanon. We withdrew in 2000, <coughs> 2005 from Gaza, and what did we get? We got the Hamas. And now if we, we were going to withdraw from the West Bank, who is going to come? ISIS, maybe. Iran, maybe. We can afford it. We have a very, very small margin between, between the sea and the West Bank. This is only 15 kilometers. In the last war we, in, in, in Gaza, the Israeli International Airport, Ben Gurion Airport, was closed for three days. For three days it was closed because rockets were launched nearby, nearby the, 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 uh, the airfield, and, and some American uh, air companies said, we're we not going to risk our travelers we are not going to, to come to Israel. If this would have been last two more days or three more days, this was the victory of the Hamas. You can, you can do whatever you want to Gaza. You can, you can hit Gaza, you can destroy Gaza, 
But if the Hamas managed to close the Israeli air, international airport for a week, he can really claim a victory, and rightfully so. So you're dealing in what we call an asymmetric <clears throat> warfare. We are much stronger than the, the Hamas. We're much stronger. Everybody knows it. We have, we have fascinating technology. We have fascinating uh, abilities, military abilities. They, 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 are, they are, I would say, 90% less, less of us. But still, we are fighting with our heads tied. We cannot use our force because of internal criticism and international criticism. So even though we are Gulliver in this case, this Gulliver cannot use his power. He is very much constrained. And that is why we say we have this traumatic experience of 2000 and 2005. We cannot afford ourselves to risk another withdrawal and endangering bringing in the, 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 the radical Islam inside our, the heart of our land. We cannot do it. We want the West Bank to, to be demilitarized, and we are the only one. This is what history shows, that if you want a territory to be demilitarized, you, you have to take care of it by yourself. You cannot ask anybody to do it. In 2006, the United States forced us, Condoleezza Rice forced us to withdraw for some part of Gaza and said, European inspector will be there, don't worry. It took just one act of terror and then all of them ran away. They didn't want to come back. And this was the Philadelphia Axis, people in Israel know it. They said, we're not going to risk our life for you. It's your problem. So again, demilitarization means that you and everybody who knows the, 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 the uh, history of, of, of Europe with dancing and with other, uh, with other cities, if you want to keep a place really demilitarized, that no arms will come into it, you have to be the one who guards the uh, entrance and the, uh, of, of everything that comes inside the territory. And to that, the Palestinians, as of now, do not agree. <coughs> and this is one of the problems, but this is a major problem between us and the Palestinians. So to be realistic, I don't see that in the, fu in the near future there is going to be an agreement between us and the Palestinians. And I've said it many times, that under these circumstances, we have to live with these agreements. It's not so bad. Many people live fine with disagreements. Many couples live with, with long disagreements between them, and they live very nicely. You don't have to agree on anything. You have to, you have to, you have to know that you, you live with controversy, and you disagree, and you, let, and you try to maximize the advantages of this situation. It doesn't have to go in, into war, you don't have to go into war or to military strike just because there is disagreement. In, the, in this, in this uh, world of ours, many, many countries in the world have territorial dis disputes between the other. Many countries. Look at China and Japan, look at Japan and Russia, look at, at, at Britain and, and Argentina. Many countries have, have, have disputes. They don't go to war for that. They live with it. And we say, unfortunately, as far as we see it in the in this in the near future, this is the situation. You know, I can I can be idealistic and say we are going to, to an agreement, but I'm realistic because I see what is the situation and not what other position, and I know the gaps between the parties. So we have to be realistic and to try to live with what we can. And again, I think I will conclude just with 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 one thing that is crucial uh, to the security of the region. 
which has, has, in my view, has changed the whole rules of the game of, of a balance of power between nations. Years ago, years ago, power of nation was judged mainly by how many airplanes they have, how many tanks they have, how many infantry they have. And there was, you know, this uh, James, uh, the, the British journal James, or every year comes with this balance of power of, of state with, you know, with this, this list. Today, I think this, this composition has changed dramatically, in my view, has changed dramatically, in my view. That doesn't mean that uh, jets and tanks are not important. They are important. But I think that with new scientific capabilities, new technology, even small state with, with great scientific ability can become like superpower. I refer mainly to the cyber abilities. Today, small states like Israel with dramatic cyber capability can benefit into in, uh, computers outside <coughs> Israel and can can cause ma massive damage without using any military weapon that it has. And as you know, it's not a secret. It has been already said, told in the uh, outside press that Israeli uh, computer experts have managed to get into the, the the nuclear system, computer system of Iran, and to install a virus inside it, which blocked them for at least five, six years. So I'm saying this kind of things make give are giving small states the ability to defend themselves. Fine, it takes just one condition: states have to develop and to, 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 to put their energies and their money and their resources mainly and dramatically on education, technology, and science. This is the name of the game in the future. That's what I believe. And since I know my country with all its faults, with all its, its bad things, we are going this way. Our universities and our scientific ability is in the top of the world, in the top of the world. And that is why I'm concluding by saying that I'm very optimistic about my, my, my country in the future. Because we are leading ahead, we are leading ahead in all these respects. And if we go on using this threat, I believe that we are going to face a brilliant future and I do hope that states friendly to Israel, like Slovenia, like other states, will take the same course and we can cooperate together for the benefit of our both states. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shalom. I would like to ask Mr. Ayaf to start uh, the discussion. I don't have two, three questions for you. Maybe the first one, this is the third, but I will, I will uh, put it as the first. Why? Because you talk in the middle of the lecture regarding about the American policy. What about the US policy toward Israel during the two Obama terms? Because it's now just seven years. Is the, uh, this some kind of isolation? Isos isolationism in the foreign policy of the United States or limited international involvement to avoid being drawn into dangers. Mm -hmm. The example of Syria and giving concession to Iran, I think you answered this. But now I will let me remind you that Obama said that I have done more than any other president to strengthen Israeli security. Is this true? Yes. More than Bush and yes. others? Yes. Please, you answer. Okay, uh, American policy uh, towards Israel has, has, has begun in a, in a collision, very embarrassing one. 
uh, the American president uh, has come with his Cairo speech on June 4th, uh, 2009, in which he said, we, the United States, we, we think that the settlements are illegal, and we demand Israel stop the build-up of settlements at once. That's what he, that's what he said. Well, it took him some days or weeks to understand that this may be a good policy, but it's not a realistic policy. Uh, he didn't manage for two, for two or three reasons. The first reason is that he promised Israel that the Arab states will give some reciprocity to Israel. And he went to Saudi Arabia, he went to Morocco, and he went to, to, to the Gulf state and said, look, I want to ask you to give the Israelis some symbolic concession, that they will feel that you know you are reciprocating to what they are doing. And what he asked Saudi Arabia is not a big deal. He said, please let El Al flights to the, to the Far East to go through the airspace of Saudi, that's all. And yeah, he went to, 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 to the Gulf state and said, please open a department of interest in Israel, in Tel Aviv, something commercial, not diplomatic, just to show that you are doing something. They said, we don't want it. We don't want it until as long as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has not been solved, we will not make any gesture towards Israel. So this is the, was the, the first thing. The other thing it was that in Israel there was a big, big uh, uh, opposition to that. And Netanyahu felt that if he's going to agree to, 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 to this course, he is going to lose his party. So he's going to lose his, 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 uh, his political career. He cannot, he cannot live with it. So he, cho he chose to, to, I think that in between coming into disagreement and collision with Obama or with, with, with his own party and coalition, he decided to, to go into collision with Obama. He said, this is better for me because otherwise I'm going to lose it, as he lost it in 1996. This was, by, by the way, that's what happened in 1996. He lost his, his, his term in, in government because he made concession. So Obama also, you know, made a reassessment, and eventually, as you know, they came to a kind of compromise, 10 months freeze of settlement, uh, not, total, not, not total freeze, but a real freeze, and we were satisfied, Americans were satisfied, but eventually it didn't really enhance the peace process, and it's, since then it was, it was blocked. There was another attempt in 2013 by, by Secretary Kerry. It's also failed. So this is the situation now. The one thing that I can say to the credit of the president is that he made a real distinction between Israel the United States and the peace process and the strategic ties between Israel and the United States. This, is, this, was, uh, this was quite unusual because until, until, uh, until then, American presidents say, look, if you don't listen to what we want, we will block arms to you. We will stop delivering arms to you. We will not give you sophisticated arms and so on and so on. President Obama has gone on a different track. He said, disagreement on the political issue is one thing, the strategic ties is a different thing. And indeed, I want to say to the credit that he kept it. And yes, he, he, the ties between Israel and the United States during his, his, his tenure in, in, in office are unprecedented. Has never been as good as, as, as it is now. Thank you. The second question is how to revive the European Union policy on the Israeli Palestinian conflict. The view of the Israeli political parties about the European Union policy and engagement. I didn't ask you about the government, but political parties, because political parties, I think some of them they are against. Uh, in Israel? Yes. The engagement of the European Union. Yes, we, we look. It's not secret that uh, in Israel the the, the feeling and the assessment is the, that the European 
basic mood, not all of them, but basically the European are not balanced in their attitude towards Israel and the Palestinians. We, this is, this is at least the, the policy of, uh, of our government. And uh, as you know, just, uh, uh, just uh, a few months ago, the French were about to, to introduce into the Security Council a resolution which actually would sort of impose on Israel a settlement according to, 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 to a map of border that will be determined by the great powers and uh, the one that will not be, will not follow this, this, uh, uh, this, um, this resolution will, will suffer from sanctions. And there was a debate in Israel whether the United States is going to, to impose a veto on this or not. Impose. Eventually, they uh, they um, uh, they decided to, uh, to, to, to not, not to go on this trade. And only two weeks ago, the French again came with with, with the idea that because there are there are demonstrations and and uh, in, inside the Jerusalem, the way to solve it is to, is to put the international inspector in the in the holy shrine nearby the Holy Shrine in, in Jerusalem. Again, everybody knows this is not realistic, it's not going to hold. But this is just you know, a symbolic uh, reflection of the way some European states uh, uh, view and attitude towards the, the conflict. In my view, it goes against their interest. Because you just cannot be a moderator, you cannot play a real real effective fight if you don't undertake balanced policy. You can, you, you, you can decide that you want to be poor, that's fine. But you're out of the game. And that's what happened to Europe. They're out, totally out of the game. So from that one time to another, they say we are going to boycott Israeli products from the settlement and so on and so on. Eventually, as of now, as of now, it doesn't really have any significant effect on Israeli economy or, in, or, or inside Israel, but it just reflects a bad atmosphere. Uh, coming from Europe to Israel, as I say, eventually it goes against the interest of Europeans because they could play a major part, much more effective part in the peace process, but they, they choose not, again, not all of them, but they choose to take a different course. So this is the situation as of now. The next question is searching for a good neighbor or a good friend not outside, I am talking about the region. And I will ask you about Turkey as a case for this. You are optimistic regarding the no, relations. I spoke with the, in the, I sent uh, the ambassador to Turkey, former one, <laughs> uh, about the uh, Turkish uh, policy. Unfortunately, it's uh, Advan Dautulu, I think uh, it's clear that the decision a certain period of time, they've undertaken a different course towards a kind of more leaning towards Islamic, uh, radical is Islamic uh, 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 foreign policy. I think the policy of Turkey was zero confrontation, zero problems, and they they ended with with uh, as many problems as they. they they, they can. They have problems in Cyprus, with, with, with Greece, with, with us, with, uh, with, with Russia. So, in my view, I, I'm not optimistic about renewing the, the, uh, renewing the, uh, the honeymoon, okay, between us. But again, I want, I want to, to emphasize that this, this does not affect the economic relationship between us and, 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 and Turkey. The Israeli export import has grown by 40 percent in in recent years towards Turkey. Israeli tourists are flooding Antalya. So you know there is the policy and there is the the commerce and economic relations. I'm really happy about it. If you ask about friends, 
I want to say that our best friend in the region is now Jordan. Jordan is, you hear from time to time, condemnation by the Jordanian against Israel, but basically the strategic ties between Israel and Jordan are very, very strong. Very, very strong because Jordan, it's not a new thing. Jordan is under danger. And the danger from Iraq, and the danger from the flood of refugees from Syria, and then from 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 ISIS, they are in danger. And it's the policy of Israel. This is what I believe that Israel will not let the Abdullah regime fall down. If the, if there is a danger to this regime in in in, in Amman, Israel will take step to uh, to stop it. So I think if there is if there is a strategic ally of Israel in the region, this is Jordan. Now, go ahead. I have because first of all, my name is Tamil Gary. I'm from Egyptian Embassy. I have many comments on what you said right now. So I'd like to know. Regarding to what is the question what you were told us about, the man who had this bombing around is signed and going to kill himself. How can it function? Aren't we asking us about why he makes something like that around himself? Do you believe that the human nature is going to kill himself by himself? Or he just going to be blocked by the Israeli policy and he don't know what, sh what shall he do? So at that time he decided to, to get off of here with his life to, to show the whole world that he, he, ha he had not any hope at all for time. This is number one. Number two, regarding to the discourse which you told us about right now, and you told us right now we, we have some kind of agreement that you believe that it's already between quotation, let's say like it's already arranged from the Israeli point of view. Why the Israelis going and going on settlement itself and build a new settlement day after day, day after day. If you know there is some kind of agreement, why we do something like that? This is number two. Number three, regarding to the nuclear capabilities which Israelis have. And you informed us that Israel can destroy the, the Iranian capabilities if she decides to, to do something like that. At the time, aren't, aren't you believe that the first, first, let's say, threat to Israel itself is Israel will destroy itself. If we use the nuclear weapon, that meaning that destroy all in all, not the Iranian only, but the Israelis and the all, all its neighbor. This is number three. The last one is regarding to what Mr. Obama said in the, in the Cairo University when he proposed some kind of, when he asked the Arab countries to open even commercial office in Israel to, to help to cooperate between the two each other. Aren't we have right now an Arabian initiative which said that if the Israelis solve the conflict we will recognize Israel. So what is it? Please, thank you for that. Okay. Okay, I forgot the first one, but I will go <laughs> different way. No now first of all, with, with regard to the settlement. Yes. Okay. I didn't go into details about it, but since you asked I will go into details. Uh, settlements have began in 67, 68. Uh, and was carried out by all the Israeli governments. Right wing, left wing, center, all of them have carried out the settlement. The United States apology toward the settlement has undergone different uh, versions. <coughs> uh, the, 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 they began with, with stating that this is an illegal uh, phenomenon, but President Reagan has changed it. He said, it's unfortunate, it's it's not positive act, but it's not illegal. And then we come to President Bush. Now, you know, I, I'm jumping in history. No, no, no. We got to, to President Bush, who met, who came to a tacit understanding with President, with the Prime Minister Al Sharon and Prime Minister Umar. The understanding stated uh, that Israel will be so-called allowed, we don't recognize officially, but 
if you do it, we'll close our eyes to build in uh, densely populated areas by Jews. Israel will not be allowed to build new settlement. It will be it will be only inside existing settlement. It will not be able to confiscate land in order to build settlement and some some other thing. This was the understanding, and and, and I said this eventually uh, was reflected in the Bush uh, uh, letter to Al Sharon, 14 April 2004, in which we said. We have to recognize that the new demographic situation has been uh, composed in the West Bank and in every peace agreement we have to, 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 uh, to take it into account. Okay, this is a kind of saying that, you know, that eventually, even if there is a peace settlement, we must recognize that certain areas in the West Bank will remain in Israeli hands. And by the way, this is our interpretation also of 2.2. Because 242 didn't say withdrawal from the territories, it said withdrawal from territories. That means it under, under, uh, undertook a kind of assumption that Israel will remain in certain territories. And there is, you know, it depends inside Israel how much are we doing enough. Maybe there are, there is needed to, to have more concessions. This is our democracy and we have our own. As of now, I believe that Israel is going according to this understanding with the United States. And if you follow the American, uh, 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 the, the American uh, uh, policy towards Israel, in recent years, you have almost heard not one single uh, condemnation of Israel with regard to the settlements. Mm -hmm. Only there was once, I think, in uh, Jerusalem, but eventually, uh, uh, basically, the Americans know exactly what we are doing, even if we are be, be, be building a small hut in the West Bank, the satellites see it and they know exactly what we are doing. Okay? So they close their eyes. So this is the policy, I think, of Israel. And I think this is in a broad consensus inside Israel. And uh, as of now, I think this does not really block a settlement because in any case, when we will come to, to, to an agreement, we will demand that densely populated areas will remain inside this place. Okay? Yes, so this one thing. With regard to, to nuclear ability, Israel built its nuclear option not in order to attack others with its capability. It was done in order to prevent another Holocaust in Israel. That's what to say. And by the way, I'm saying to my students that if God forbid you have to lose nuclear capability, you have lost the war. You have lost it because a nuclear option is meant only for deterrence. Now, if God forbid there is a military strike, nuclear strike against Israel, what what uh, will it give Israel to know that other states are also destroyed? Their revenge is meaningless. Meaningless. The whole idea of nuclear option is to, to prevent anybody from thinking of attacking us because he will know the retaliation. But if God forbid it doesn't work, what's the use of revenge? Okay? Uh, the, the, the Saudi plan or, or the Saudi proposal or the Arabian proposal yes. is a good. Who prevents, who prevents the Saudi to come to, to Israel and say, let's talk about it? Who prevents them? Who prevents, who prevents the Saudis, the, the, the Bahraini, the Abu Dhabi, the Dubai? Why don't they come to Israel and say, let's talk about your, our plan? You say your view, I say my view. You cannot put a plan and say, look, you accept it all together as it is. No. Settlements by states are done by dialogue. You give something, I give something. I think this is a very positive plan. I think it's a great, great uh, advancement. But let's talk about it. Okay, I'm sorry, what was the first issue? With regard to the suicide bomber. Okay. 
Oh, so is that look, look, look. I know, I know he is. I, I'm saying, I, I was saying it to, to, to the class uh, two hours ago. The problem is that I know that those who are doing it believe that they are doing it because they believe in their covenant. I know it. I know this is the greatest problem. And that's why I said, I said to, to the student, I think this lady was in the, in the class, I said, it's a big problem because there is conviction in the other side and because he's highly motivated and he believes in what he's doing, this is a, a problem. And our greatest, the greatest danger in this regard is when you, you underestimate the motivation and the capabilities of your rival. You have to know that the, uh, your, your, your enemy is capable and smart and motivated and never underestimate him because once you, you do it, you lose the game. Okay. Another question? Professor, it was very interesting to listen to your presentation. It is, of course, I would, I would dare to say that many in this audience do not agree with several things that you said. But a democratic dialogue, learning for the others, I think it's always a productive thing. So I thank you for your statement, it was very clear. There are certain things which, of course, also I could agree, some which I would agree. I know, yes, that Israel is, you started with the Munich Agreement, and later on, of course, the first war in 48, 49, started to destroy Israel. And the idea of eliminating Israel as a state was there. Mm -hmm several decades, and a few years ago, even in Tehran, the then president used to say many times, we will destroy Israel as a state. So a state in such a situation, of course, has a good reason to take care for itself. And maybe the logic of thinking there is different than the logic of thinking in a state like Slovenia, where we are. <coughs> Nobody disputes our existence. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to eliminate us. We may have a dispute here and there, but here with us, etc. So, many times when we look at the situation, we don't, we don't understand the special complication of the Middle East dispute, or, better to, or maybe simply to say, the Palestinian problem. Uh, of course, one should not, on the other side, and I had the opportunity to serve as the chairman of the board and director of the International Atomic Agency, and I was a member of the board, and I was chairing the board, so I'm pretty much involved in the 10 years ago, 8 years ago, in the Iranian nuclear problem. And I can assure you, because of a kind of loyalty to my function at that time, I will not go into details. But certain things were known to me. But something was there also in the air that, of course, the Iranians had their preoccupations with their security. Not only with their security, also with their imagination about their role in the region. With another word, they felt isolated, prevented, blocked on all sides, which also radicalized their opinion. I have a feeling now that with the last developments, in the last 10 years, although the problem is still there, but many things have changed. I believe that even in Israel, the idea of two sovereign states two good neighbors, Palestine, Israel, is basically accepted. Yes. I even believe that in Iran, I don't hear last few years statements about annihilating Israel. Mm -hmm. So 
there is also a kind of optimism there. The things are changing. But in a way, a realistic approach is slowly prevailing. I would, if I would have a comment on the Israeli policy, I would say that maybe, but I can understand the reasons for that, you could use more the opportunities which are coming to start. But you should, in a way, be more proactive, taking care of your security, but be also more proactive to build your security also in the fact that the best security, if you have no problems with your neighbors. So one would expect, if I would be in your shoes, I would somehow be more active, more forthcoming, taking care for my security, yes, but also more forthcoming with initiatives, with endeavors to continue to build, to build this mutual trust. But slowly, after so many wars, and far away from claiming that Israel was the culprit for this war. So on both sides, sometimes it's whatever, it's not important. But the idea there that we can live in peace together <laughs> is getting down slowly. And uh, I would expect more activity to be I will only ask you in this comment, I don't want to go lengthy into that because you are the lecturer, not me. Mm -hmm. Uh, two questions. One question is, is, according to you, I agree, in Iran all want to have nuclear weapons. That I know. I would involved in that. I, I don't know. Like everybody in Russian Federation wants Russia to be a big power again. Even a taxi driver wants that and a politician wants that. That's clear. In Iran, they believe that will bring them not security so much, but equality among the farmers. Yeah, yeah. They want to have that. Yeah. But still, do you notice that their rhetoric is slowly changing? I have a feeling it is. Yeah. I would be glad to have confirmed by you, because you watch that. And the next question, the second question. Professor, you have, of course, yes. There will be a territorial settlement, there should be a settlement for Jerusalem, uh, whatever, a kind of special status, etc., etc. Et but you didn't touch one of the problems, which is extremely important, and I see very little chance how to handle it, the right to return, the refugee problem, the right to return. Could you maybe have a comment on that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Yes, this is one uh, of the problems. We have, we have actually three, three main uh, problems with the Palestinian. One is the border, the other one is Jerusalem, and the other one is what they are called right of return, uh, Palestinian right of return to, to Israel. Uh, when Omar was prime minister, he summoned Abu Mazen to his office, and after many meetings, he offered him, he offered him almost 90%, over 90% of the West Bank to be in the head of, of the Palestinian. The Jerusalem, uh, part of them, especially the, whole, the holy places would be under international uh, governorship, and that Israel would, would agree to a, to a humanita humanitarian right of return. That means people who wants to gather their families and so on, we will let them. But this, the, the issue of right of return is in a very broad concern in Israel, that we cannot allow a flood of Palestinians coming to Israel because we are a Jewish state. And this was said in the Declaration of Independence, we want to be with the majority of Jewish people. We have already a minority of about 20% of the population. We don't want to change it. So this is under under agreement, and even Prime Minister Ulmer, who was who has gone as far as anybody else in Israel towards the Palestinians, said this issue I cannot go on home with that. I will agree to thousands of Palestinians coming to Israel to reunite families and so on, but not 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 uh, not the flood of uh, of the Palestinians. 
So this is this uh, this is one issue, and this is one of the problems. Yes, this is one of the problems. There are others. The problem with, that I did mention also the Israel demand that the Palestinians would recognize the, the Jewish state would proclaim in Arabic. He said, "I want, I want, I want." <laughs> I want Abu Mazen to say in Arabic that he organized Israel, not Israel, but Israel is a Jewish state. Okay, okay, so just one of the problems. There are many problems. That's why I said, realistically, the gaps are too big and I don't see an agreement coming in the near future. Your view is shared by many, many Israelis. Your view that Israel can show more moderation can be more forthcoming. As you know, you can follow, you, you, you would see what is said in the Knesset, what is said by, by many, many politicians in Israel. Many, many criticize this government, and this is democracy. Uh, he, he won the majority in this uh, last election, and he is, he, is, he is the leader of the state of Israel, okay? <coughs> but your viewpoint is shared by a big, big, uh, groups inside Israel. Uh, with regard to, to Iran, yes, of course, uh, President Rouhani uh, is not Ahmadinejad. Certainly, we don't hear uh, more rhetoric about uh, throwing the Jews to the sea, uh, uh, ignoring the Holocaust, the Holocaust didn't exist at all. Uh, it's all fairy tales of, of, of Israelis that six million were killed, nobody. Uh, there were only few were killed and so on. Well, what is different? But if you ask me, is he different in what he, he is doing? No. No. Still, the, the government is harsh on, on the right, human rights, on homosexuals, on, on, every, uh, on, on, the, on the ability of people to express themselves. They are very, very, very harsh. Very, very harsh. And yes, in rhetoric, they, are, they, look, they look nicer, they look more modern, they look more Western. And this is causing us a, a problem in a way. But we will judge Iran not by its statement, but what they are doing on the ground. That means we will look especially how they fulfill the agreement. And if they fulfill the agreement, and they, we will be more than happy because we are the last one who wants to use any kind of military uh, capability against Iran. We know the risk of this. This is not this is not a fun story. It's a very very dangerous thing to do. Okay, and I believe that we will take it only if we will see that there is no other choice of stopping Iran from being in nuclear space. Thank you very much for your answers. Please, yeah. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and discussion really? as much <coughs> as I did. I would like to thank Professor Dr. Zaki Shalom for his inter interesting lecture, which will help us understand better the situation in Israel and the Middle East in general. At the end, I would like to invite you uh, to our next lecture on uh, 17th November at 4 o'clock p.m. Our guest will be Mr. Zoran Zaev, opposition leader in Macedonia, chairman of Social Democratic Alliance of Macedonia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.